Dead America, the Second Month, the SoCal Mission, Part One, written by Derek Slayton, narrated by Aaron Smith. Chapter One, Seattle Rebuild, Day Eight. Private Duncan's eyes were heavy as he stood in line at the food dispensary. He rubbed them with his knobby hands, his lanky frame hunched over with exhaustion. The snow from the previous day had subsided, however some patches still hung around in shaded areas. There were about a half dozen people in line ahead of him, with more filling in behind. He looked at his watch, seeing that his shift was about to begin. I don't care if I'm a few minutes late. If I don't get coffee, I'm going to fall asleep at my desk, he thought, his mouth widening in a hard yawn. The line finally began to move and he was able to step inside the small shop that had once served donuts back when the world was sane. What I wouldn't give for a cream-filled, chocolate-covered donut, he thought wistfully. Hell, I'd even settle for a basic three-day-old glazed donut at this point. The line continued to move, and Duncan pulled out his ration ticket, stifling another loud yawn. He could hear whining up ahead, but was too tired to strain his ears to hear what it was all about. Yeah, yeah, come on, pal. We're all in the same boat, he thought bitterly. Just get your breakfast and move on. A moment later, the man swept by, grumbling under his breath, with no food in his hands. Duncan shook his head. Even in the apocalypse, there were still disgruntled, pissy customers. The next few people got their orders, and finally he reached the counter. Yeah, let me get the largest coffee currently allowed by law, and whatever breakfast pastry is the most sugar, he said hoarsely, and handed over his ration ticket. The clerk turned around and grabbed a twelve-ounce cup of hot coffee and half a prepackaged cheese danish on a napkin. He set it down on the counter, and Duncan blinked down at it before looking back up at the clerk. Half a danish and a shot glass of coffee? he scoffed. I need something to jumpstart my day. The clerk pointed to the dressings table. We have some sugar packets over there if you want to do a line like it's cocaine, he said dryly. Duncan blinked at him, and then snapped his mouth shut, biting back a retort. It wasn't the clerk's fault that they were running low on goods. He nodded and picked up his stuff. Appreciate it, man, he said tiredly. Good luck today. Thanks the clerk replied with a sigh. Gonna need it. Duncan approached the table, ripping open half a dozen packets of sugar and dumping them into the coffee, raising the liquid in the cup to the point that it was almost overflowing. He downed a quarter of it in a single gulp, to make sure none of the liquid gold would spill on his walk. The sun shone warm on his face once he got outside, making the short stroll to the command centre almost enjoyable. He stopped for a moment to bask in the sun, letting out a defeated sigh as he did. Twelve hours of staring at a computer, and I get thirty seconds of sunlight. He shook his head. At least I don't have to burn a ration for lunch since it's brought to me. He paused, grunting to himself. Really, that's the best silver lining you can come up with. Apocalypse happens, and somehow you're still a drone. He took a bite of his makeshift breakfast as he walked into the command center. It was a hive of activity, computer screens glowing everywhere, people running this way and that for shift change. The guard at the front door gave him a head nod as he downed the rest of his Danish. The guard was older and pudgy, looking like he was pulled out of retirement when the zombie outbreak began. How's your count going? Duncan asked. Hit forty-five push-ups overnight. The guard replied, patting his bicep. Felt like my arms were going to fall off after that. Duncan grinned. Hell yeah. You'll be at fifty a day by the end of the week, he said. You're going to be looking buff like those special forces guys at the end of the month. The guard poked his moderate gut. Frankly, I'll just be happy to shave a few inches off of this, he said. Duncan held up his cup of coffee and empty napkin. Given the ration sizes these days, I don't think that's going to be an issue, he said dryly. The guard winced, 
slim pickings? he asked. The private nodded. Half a Danish today, he said with a sigh. There goes my hope for steak and eggs, the guard quipped, and they shared a chuckle before Duncan glanced over at his terminal. Private Rhodes, who worked the night shift, waved his arms frantically, staring at him. Looks like it's going to be that kind of day, Duncan muttered. He yelled out a little while ago, the guard said, inclining his head to the frantic soldier, asking if anybody knew when you'd be in. Better go check this out, Duncan grunted. Have a good one. You too, the guard replied. Duncan walked through the office towards the young private, crumpling up his napkin and tossing it in a nearby trash can. Morning, Rhodes. Is there a problem? He asked casually. You tell me, Rhodes cried and pointed to the monitor. Nestled in the dozens of lines of bright green text was one that blinked a furious red. Duncan's gaze hardened. Move, he snapped. Move! He chugged the rest of his coffee in a single gulp and shoved the empty cup at Rhodes before hitting the seat and typing rapidly. How long has it been like this? Uh, I don't know. Half hour or so? Rhodes replied, clutching the empty paper cup as if it were a lifeline. And you didn't come get me? Duncan snarled. The younger private withered under his tone. It was thirty minutes, he explained meekly. And I didn't know if it was serious or not. You have one fucking job, Duncan snapped. If something goes from green to red, you come find me, regardless of the time. It was thirty minutes, Rhodes whined. By the time I left, found you, and got back here, it, it wouldn't be that much different. So instead of yelling at me, why don't you work on the problem? Get the fuck out of here, Duncan snarled, glaring a hole into the computer screen. Rhodes slunk away, crunching the paper cup as he went, and Duncan instantly forgot him as he clicked on the red entry and pulled up the information he needed. Oh, dear God, he breathed as he frantically made notes, scribbling across his notepad. He grabbed a nearby calculator and smashed numbers into it, his eyes glazing over at the numbers he was crunching. He jotted down several more notes and then looked around frantically. In the main conference area, General Stevens sat with Clint and Corporal Gad. The door was closed, indicating they were having a meeting, but he knew it couldn't wait. Duncan sprinted over, busting inside without so much as a knock. General, I— What in the hell are you doing, Private? Stevens barked. Can't you see we're in a meeting? Duncan stammered. Sir, we have a major problem. Do you see all of this? Stevens interrupted again his voice rising as he motioned to the papers all over the table. All of these are major problems. Whatever yours is can wait. Report it up the chain of command and it'll reach my desk and be dealt with. You're dismissed. Duncan let out a noise of frustration. General, you have to— Stevens kicked his chair back angrily, storming forward until he was nose to nose with the private. You got a set of coconuts on your boy, he snarled. You say one more word to me and I'm going to have you escorted to the front lines, handed a pointy stick, and shoved in the direction of the nearest zombie-infested building. Dismissed! Duncan didn't even flinch at the general yelling in his face, instead staring him dead in the eye. We have 62 hours to prevent a nuclear power plant meltdown, he snapped. So you can either listen to me right now, or we can start packing up the safe zone and move a few hundred miles to the east. Stevens blinked at him and then took a step back. Say what you gotta say, Private, he said, a note of apology in his tone. My job here is to monitor the West Coast nuclear power plants, Duncan explained. These facilities have the ability to be controlled remotely, which we have been able to do. We've managed to put them down to the lowest output while keeping the safety protocols in place. It's not ideal, but it's the best we can do currently. He turned to the table, setting down his papers. Thirty minutes ago, we lost the ability to issue commands to the San Onofre plant in Southern California. What does that mean exactly? Clint piped up, leaning forward. It means we can't adjust the safety measures or keep the power output in check, Duncan replied. Gad's brow furrowed. Is it just a temporary glitch? He suggested. I don't think so, Duncan replied, shaking his head. 
These systems are built pretty solidly, so it shouldn't drop out. What could have caused it? Clint asked. Duncan let out a deep breath. I don't know, he admitted. Could be any number of things, but it's highly unlikely it's on our end. Gad looked at the West Coast map. This plant is over a thousand miles away, he mused. How is it going to pose a threat to us? Honestly, that's above my pay grade, Duncan replied with a sigh. I was an IT guy for the Navy on the nuclear subs, which is how I landed this job. All I know is that the plant is right on the coast and nuclear meltdowns are never a good thing. Sorry if I was hyperbolic before, but we don't have a lot of time before this thing reaches the point of no return. Clint raised a hand. How long did you say? he asked. At the current pace, the output is growing and safety measures are failing. Sixty-two hours, Duncan replied. How long will it take you to check to see if the problem is on our side? Stevens asked. Fifteen, twenty minutes, the private replied with a shrug. There are only so many things it could be from this side. Go now, do it, Stevens instructed. And then, as Duncan turned around, added, Private, thank you for standing up to me. Just try not to make a habit of it if you can help it. Yes, sir, Duncan replied with a small smile and left. Okay, this takes priority, Stevens said, flattening his palms on the table. Clint, get on the line to Washington. I need satellite imagery of the plant and anything else you can think is relevant. Corporal, go through the census and see if we have anybody who has ever set foot in a nuclear power plant. Gad cocked his head. And if we don't? he asked. Have John Teeter find you one in the stadiums, the general replied. We need answers, and we need them now. Meeting in thirty. Go. Clint and Gad rushed from the room leaving Stevens sitting by himself with the pile of notes. He raised his wrist and set a sixty-two-hour timer on his watch. He took a deep, steadying breath, and then got to work. Chapter 2 Sixty-one and a half hours until meltdown Stevens led Clint and Duncan to the conference table as Gad joined them with a middle-aged civilian in tow. Sorry we're late, Gad said. He was on the other side of the safe zone. Dr. Charlie Massey, the civilian said as he took a seat. Good to meet you. What are you a doctor of? Stevens asked. Charlie laced his fingers together on the table. I have a PhD in nuclear engineering, he said pertly, with a variety of degrees in relevant fields. Good enough for me. Stevens replied. Meet the crew. I'm Clint, Clint said, motioning to the others. This is General Stevens and Private Duncan. Welcome to our nightmare. The corporal here didn't go into a lot of detail about the problem, Charlie admitted. Can somebody please fill me in? Stevens motioned to the other soldier. Duncan, he invited. About an hour ago we lost the ability to interact with the San Onofre power plant the private explained, passing over his notes. We have been keeping the output levels low and the safety protocols level. In the last hour, however, the output levels have started to inch up and the safety protocols are starting to fail, albeit slowly. Charlie studied the notes, scrunching up his face in thought as if he were thinking hard. So, by my calculations, he finally said, running his finger down the page, we're looking at sixty-one hours and some change before a full-fledged meltdown. Duncan nodded. That's my math as well, he agreed. And the problem can't be fixed from this end? Charlie asked. The private shook his head. Our systems are operational, he replied. The problem is definitely on the plant end. Okay, the doctor said, and shrugged. So, what are your questions? If this thing goes critical and melts down, what kind of fallout are we looking at? Stevens asked. Is it going to put our safe zone at risk? Charlie shook his head. Not directly, he replied. This is a lower yield plant that has begun the process of being decommissioned, which was interrupted by the whole dead rising thing. Even the worst case scenario would only irritate a hundred, hundred and fifty mile radius, and that outer area would take years to reach lethal levels. However, Clint sighed. There's always a however, 
he muttered. There's a reason to be concerned since this plant sits directly on the coast, Charlie continued. I'm not that up on ocean currents, however. If the core makes its way into the water, which is highly probable given the location of the plant, we could see irradiated water up here. Gad leaned forward. Are we talking barely detectable levels, or are we going to have to fight off mutant fish? he asked. Marine life isn't stupid, Charlie replied matter-of-factly. If enough of the fish begin to die off from the radiation, they'll move on to a different part of the ocean. And while I haven't studied the long-term effects of living near irradiated water, I can assure you that it wouldn't be good for the population here, especially if we ever have to rely on using the desalinators to provide fresh drinking water. Stevens took a deep breath. Doctor, I want your honest assessment, he piped up. If you had to make the call... Would you risk men's lives to try and get this plant back online and prevent a meltdown? Absolutely, Charlie replied without hesitation. I assume that someday we're going to be able to retake this country from the undead, and it would be nice to be able to visit Socal without worrying about getting irradiated cancer. Not to mention the fact that there are undoubtedly survivors within the fallout zone. Dying from radiation poisoning isn't very high on the preferred ways to die list, if you know what I mean. So, what are our options? Clint asked. Yeah, I mean, we have all these cruise missiles sitting a few hundred yards from us out in the bay. Can't we just lob a few of them in that direction? Gad added. Charlie shook his head, finally showing some signs of exasperated cracks in his patient armor. You want to blow up a nuclear power plant? He asked dryly. Couple problems with that. If a missile managed to hit the core... It would be like setting off a massive dirty bomb, sending irradiated material far and wide, including into the water. Also, back in the good old days of the Cold War, this scenario was anticipated in war games, which is why the facilities on the coast were reinforced against missile attack. Clint cocked his head. In other words, we're not blowing it up, he said, more to Gad than anyone else. So... We have to send a team in to reset it manually? Stevens asked. That's about the only option, Charlie replied. Yes, sir. Clint began to pass out satellite images of the power plant that he'd acquired. That's not going to be the easiest job, unfortunately, he said. The images were marked to show a mile radius around it. I don't see what the big deal is, Gad said, motioning to the left side of the photo. It's right on the beach. We can land a craft and run right up to it. Look again, Clint quipped. I did, he snapped in the face of condescension. There's nothing on the beach. Clint sighed. Have you ever been to a California beach? he asked. No, but I've been to the beach before, Gad replied, blinking at him. Have you ever seen black sand at a beach that's not near a volcano? Clint prompted, eyebrows rising. Well, the corporal stammered. No. He squinted at the image, realizing that the entire coast was blacked out, as were the roads near the facility. Jesus Christ, he breathed when he realized what that meant. There you go, buddy. Glad you caught up, Clint said, and then turned back to the table. So, yeah, as you can all see, a water landing is completely out of the question. No clue what brought that many zombies there, but they're shoulder to shoulder and stretched on for miles. Duncan raised his hand. What about parachuting in? he asked. Too many possibilities for something to go wrong, Stevens countered. The wind at the coast is going to be immense, and that target landing zone is small. Plus, we don't know what's inside the complex, and there isn't much in the way of a safe open space for landing there anyway, Clint added. Good thought, though. I have, however, spitballed a rough plan out, if you'll turn to the West Coast map. He passed out images of the West Coast, each with a red line going to the southeast from Seattle before turning back to the southwest, until finally going southwest to the coast right by the circled plant. There were three X marks on the line. Our fuel situation here is non-existent, but I think I found enough fuel to get to a small Cedarville airport. Clint explained. It's just over the California border, and from the satellite view it doesn't look like it was hit all that hard. 
Not much around it. From there, they can refuel and get to Edwards Air Force Base, which, to be honest, could be a bit of trouble. Stephen shook his head. Then why not route them to another airport? he asked. Or just have them push on to the final destination? I ran the math after looking at the images of other regional airports, Clint replied, shaking his head. Edwards is the only realistic chance we have at refueling. The others that are nearby have either been overrun by zombies, or there are survivor camps nearby, leading us to believe they've already been looted. Stephen's gaze hardened. Edwards is massive and would be a tempting target for looters, he pointed out. I understand that, sir, but it's the best choice out of bad options, Clint explained. These smaller airports have one refueling spot. Edwards has more than all the regionals combined. With any luck, one of them won't be tapped out. Gad raised a hand. Not meaning to interrupt, but where in the hell did you find more fuel for the planes? He asked. I thought we're out. Well, with everything going on in Boise, I sent Buck out yesterday on an airport run, Clint explained. It was a long shot, but it paid off. The corporal bristled. You sent Buck out? He asked. Didn't think to tell me? You were busy, Clint replied, waving a non-committal hand. Point is, we have enough fuel to fill up a plane a couple of times over, and while sending more men out to Captain Kersey would be preferable, this seems like the most prudent use of the resource. Stevens pressed his palms down on the table. Okay, back to the issue at hand, gentlemen, he declared firmly. I'm assuming that even with the fuel... We won't be able to send a huge team. I have a six-seater plane being prepped right now, Clint replied. Eight seats, if you count the pilot and co-pilot, so we can get a team of eight, assuming one of them can fly. I think I know the team, Gad piped up. Clint's brow furrowed. How? he asked. The corporal flipped through one of his notebooks, finally settling on a page. Well... While you were busy cooking up secret missions for our biker friends, he teased, I put together contingency plans. Clint playfully shook his head. Uh-huh, he drawled. Sergeant Wrangle, Gad said, finding his paper. He has a seven-man squad that specialized in scouting missions during the assault on Seattle. They ran 33 missions during that week, getting deep within occupied territory to report back. They evaded contact, and when they encountered it, managed to do what needed to be done without firing a shot. Clint nodded. Which is good, since bullets are non-existent at this point, he added. Good. Make contact with them and get them ready to move, Stevens instructed, and then paused, taking a solemn beat. Make sure they know this is most likely a one-way trip. Gad nodded. Understood, sir, he said. The general raised a hand, and... If they think they need an eighth man, they can take whoever they want, he added. I'm the eighth, Charlie piped up. All eyes turned to him, confused. Out of the question, Stephen shot back. You are far too valuable to send out into the field, especially on what is essentially a suicide mission. The doctor shook his head. You don't have a choice, he replied primely. You need an expert to handle problems that come up. We have Private Duncan. Stevens replied, flicking a hand at the young soldier. He can handle it. Whoa, whoa, Duncan piped up. I'm a computer nerd. I am not cut out for the field. Besides, I'm struggling to keep up with what needs to be done here. I've never even set foot in a nuclear power plant. I have all the faith in the world in you, Private, Stevens declared. Charlie sighed. With all due respect, General, he said, voice rising a bit in volume. I don't think Duncan here is cut out for this mission. He's just being dramatic, Stevens replied. He got through basic, he'll get through this. Not what I mean, the doctor shot back. Getting a nuclear plant back under control is a lot more than re-establishing an internet connection. If some of the safeguard thresholds have been crossed over, you don't just flip a switch and things go back to normal. No offense to your abilities, Duncan. But sending you would be like sending a podiatrist to do brain surgery. If it means I don't have to go on a suicide mission, no offense taken, Duncan replied. Stevens glared at Charlie. Doctor, we are not going to risk your life, he said firmly. 
so instead you're going to potentially sacrifice eight lives for nothing, and doom countless others to a painful, excruciating death? Charlie replied, throwing up his hands. What's the point of doing this mission if you aren't sending the people who are capable of making it a success? Surely I can't be the only nuclear energy specialist you have in your stadiums? Stevens side-glanced Gad, who ran his finger down the census data in front of him. There are at least two dozen others in the stadium, the corporal said. The general sighed, steepling his fingers and pressing them against his mouth, thinking long and hard. Charlie was incredibly important to the community, but the mission would likely fail without him. Doctor, he finally said, just so you know, there is a high probability you don't come back from this mission. Are you sure you want to do this? Charlie shrugged. Knowing what happens if I do nothing? He asked. Yes, I'm sure. I wouldn't want to live with that knowledge anyway. Okay, Stevens relented. Clint, Corporal, get him prepped along with Sergeant Wrangle and his team. After replying in the affirmative, he continued, Private Duncan, you give him every bit of information you have on the situation. And, Doctor, give Duncan any instructions you have. I don't want to go through all of this and have it fail because of a screw-up on our end. Charlie nodded. It'll be done, he said. Good luck, Stephen said. Keep me posted on the situation. Everyone got up from the table, ready to face this difficult day. Charlie, I have a few questions for you before you go, Duncan piped up. I know time isn't on our side, but can you give me fifteen minutes? Charlie asked, turning to Gad. You stay with him, Clint said. I'll be back in a few minutes. The corporal's brow furrowed. Where are you going? he asked. Going to go dig through my couch cushions for some loose bullets, Clint joked and headed off. Gad crossed his arms and waited, Charlie and Duncan burying their noses in the computer and writing furious notes. Chapter 3 Sixty and a half hours until meltdown. Clint and Gad pulled up to the airfield with Charlie in tow. There was a small plane being prepped on the runway, fueling up. They got out of the vehicle and walked over to a small building where Sergeant Wrangle and his team sat around a table. Some of them had their feet up, relaxing, and a few sat in the corner playing cards. Look alive, everybody. We got company. The sergeant barked when he spotted the trio of men approaching them. The card players finished up their hand, Private Bernard slamming his cards down in celebration, leaving Private Lyons and Private Garrett to groan in his wake. He snatched up the ration tickets from the table that they'd bet. Thank you, gentlemen, he declared. I'll be thinking of you while I enjoy my feast. I said, look alive, Wrangle barked. I mean you too, Bernard. Yes, sir, the private replied, properly chastised as he shoved his tickets in his pocket. Sergeant Wrangle, Clint asked as the trio made it to the door. The one and only, the sergeant drawled, turning to him. You must be the general's right-hand man. You are correct, Clint replied, motioning to his companion. I'm Clint, and this is Corporal Gad. The sergeant cocked his head, peering past them. And who's the smart guy there? he asked. Dr. Charlie Massey, the doctor piped up from behind them. Pleasure to meet you. A doctor, huh? Wrangle drawled. Is it time for our physicals already? Not that kind of doctor. Charlie said dryly. I figured that, the sergeant quipped. Now, why don't you tell us what this is all about? This is the first day off we've had in two and a half weeks, and as far as I can tell, we've more than earned it. Gad took a deep breath. Going to have to settle for an early morning off, sergeant, he said. Hundred and fifty thousand soldiers packed into this safe zone like sardines. And we're the only ones available? Corporal Reed asked, crossing his arms. Come on, man. I have plenty of men available, Gad replied. But you're the best at what we need done, so I figured I would give you the first crack at this mission. That's some grade-A bullshit, Corporal, Wrangle said with a chuckle. So good that it warms my heart to hear it. It's a trap, Sergeant, Reed warned. 
Rangel nodded. Oh, I know, he said, pointing at Gad in amusement. I see that look in his eye. We can pass on this mission, but he'd make me admit that we aren't the best, and no self-respecting soldier would do that. So lay it on us. What do you need us to do for you? There's a nuclear power plant in Southern California that's going to melt down in the next sixty hours, Gad said, not beating around the bush, and the soldiers all froze in shock. We need you and your team to escort Dr. Massey to the facility so he can prevent that from happening. Wrangle was the first to snap into the moment, face and voice deadly serious. We have sixty hours to get to SoCal? he asked. Boat? Negative. Clint replied, shaking his head. Coastal assault is out of the question, with near total infestation at the site. You're going by plane with a few stops along the way. He pulled out his maps and the imagery of the site, handing them over to the sergeant. We have enough fuel for you to get to the first stop, which should allow you to refuel and get to Edwards. Do you have a pilot? Private Cohen raised his hand. Right here, he declared. Started flying crop dusters when I was sixteen, moved up to small passenger planes at eighteen, and to answer your next question, yes, I can fly the plane you have on the runway. Straight and to the point, I like it, Clint commended, inclining his head to the young private. Sergeant, you need to know that this is most likely a one-way trip, Gad said tentatively. So do you want this mission? Corporal, last time I checked, we were in the military. Wrangle drawled. The general can order us to go if he wants to. Gad straightened. He wanted me to ask nonetheless, he said. Is it important? the sergeant asked. Important enough that they're willing to risk losing a stadium VIP like me, Charlie put in. Oh, look at that, Reed. We have ourselves a genuine VIP, the sergeant quipped, sarcasm evident in his tone. The corporal put a hand to his chest with a mock gasp. Do we bow or curtsy? He joked. I forgot what the protocol is. Charlie sighed, shaking his head. Sorry, that's not what I meant, he insisted. No, no, we get it, Mr. VIP, Wrangle said, waving him off. We're grunts who would have been left out in the cold, and you were so important you got scooped up and got to sleep in a warm and cozy bed. All while we're out here, sleeping two hours a night, slaughtering the undead. Look, he's a nuclear engineer, Clint snapped, and keeping him alive is paramount to the success of this mission. So rip into him all you like, just make sure you get him there in one piece. Reed smirked. Don't worry, we plan on doing both, he said and shot the doctor a playful wink. Charlie winced, clearly realizing he was going to be living with his poor choice of words for the duration of this mission. Private Preston slowly raised his hand, and when he didn't speak, Clint pointed at him, motioning for him to speak. Hey, yeah, um, he stammered. Since you're sending us into certain death, I'm assuming you're going to be providing us with a proper loadout? Yeah, I second that, Lyons added. Garrett raised both of his fists. Me too, he declared. As I'm sure you're all aware, Gad said, raising his palms, bullets are at a premium these days. Shit, man, that's the understatement of the century, Reed shot back, shaking his head. I haven't seen a bullet in two days. Clint took a deep breath. Well, I scrounged around and managed to pull together forty-five for you, he said slowly. Forty-five? Garrett said, nodding. Mag and a half? Okay. I can do some damage with that. Lyons grinned. Shit, man. With that, we could take over a small town, he declared, and they bumped fists. Clint shook his head. I think you misunderstand, he said, and pulled the small bag from his back, tossing it to the table. You have forty-five bullets total. There was a long, pregnant silence, and then Garrett threw up his hands. You have got to be fucking kidding me, he cried. Clint sighed. Wish I wasn't private, he said gently. It's okay, we've done more with less, Wrangle quipped before his soldiers could go into full meltdown mode. We'll get this one too, not the first suicide mission we've run. 
Gad offered a smile. If it helps, we do have an assortment of bladed instruments in the trunk, he said. Take whatever you need. How much time do we have again? Wrangle asked. Charlie pointed to his watch that was counting down. Just over sixty hours, he said. Cohen, what's our flight time? the sergeant asked, holding out the map to the pilot. The sergeant took the papers and did calculations in his head as he scanned the page. We can do about one fifty an hour in that thing, he murmured. And let's call it, um, fourteen hundred miles to the final destination. So we're at nine and a half hours there. Hour at each of the first two stops, so... He looked up at Wrangle. Eleven and a half hours, door to door? Let's round it up to twelve, which means we have forty-eight hours to play with, the sergeant said with a nod. Doctor, how long do you need in the control room? The doctor raised a finger. You can call me Charlie, he said. All right, Charlie, how long do you need? Wrangle quipped. Not going to know until I get there, the doctor admitted. Could be five minutes, could be five hours, impossible to tell. Fair enough. We'll call it five just to be on the safe side, Wrangle said. So we have forty-three hours from the time we land to the time you need to be sitting in front of that computer screen inside the plan. We'll make it work. Lyons raised his hand. Hey, I have a question I don't believe has been covered yet, he piped up. Go ahead, Clint said, regarding him. Yeah, so I know you labeled it a suicide mission and all, Lyons said. But just in case it's not, do you have any idea of how we're getting out? As much as I love SoCal, I would rather not be stuck there. Gad took a deep breath. We're still working on that angle, he admitted. Ideally, you'd be able to get back to the plane and retrace your steps up here. If that's not an option, we can attempt a sea pickup. Oh, great, Lyons scoffed. So the survival plan involves us crowd surfing across a sea of corpses. Gad sighed. Like I said, we're working on it, he said, his face betraying his exhaustion. Relax, Lyons. They have sixty whole hours to figure this out, Wrangle said. Come on, let's get geared up. We got work to do. Everybody got up from the table and headed outside. Check the truck before you load up, Clint instructed, motioning towards the vehicle. We have rations and some other miscellaneous gear I was able to dig up. Take whatever you need. Wrangle sidled up to Clint as the others went ahead, lowering his voice. I'm assuming we're going to be too far away for contact, he asked. You will be, Clint replied softly. I'm working to get a ship down there so at least you'll have a way to relay information to somebody. Presumably, once Charlie gets the connection back up, he'll be able to communicate with our tech here. But that won't do a lot of good when it comes to coordinating extraction. The sergeant raised his chin. Will you shoot straight with me? he asked. Clint nodded. Yep, he said, firmly. I've been on a lot of missions called suicide runs that were about as dangerous as walking across a small town intersection, Wrangle said. On a scale of one to fuck my life, how bad is it? Clint took a deep breath. Sergeant, I'll say this, he said, stopping his walk and turning to the man. There aren't a lot of soldiers who could pull this off but based on your mission success history, you're on my short list of people who can. Wrangle smirked. Oh, fuck it. I'll take it, he said and clapped Clint on the shoulder. Be safe, Sergeant, Clint said. Wrangle nodded and jogged up to the others, grabbing gear and rations out of the trunk. Gad approached Clint out of earshot of the team. What did he ask you? he asked. How suicidal this mission actually is, Clint replied simply. The corporal cocked his head. What did you tell him? he asked. That he's on the short list of people who can pull it off, Clint replied. Gad took a deep breath. Let's hope you're right, he said. Chapter 4 56 Hours Until Meltdown the soldiers and Charlie were packed into a small plane that was once used as a sightseeing attraction. The seats were somewhat comfortable, at least for the non-muscle-bound passengers. Cohen was behind the controls with Wrangle in front, and Charlie sat in the back, reading a beat-up paperback. 
He barely spent more than a few seconds on the page before flipping to the next, and Garrett stared at him open-mouthed at the speed. He watched with confused awe as the extremely focused doctor sped through the book as they flew. Finally, he finished it and set it down, blinking when he realized Garrett was staring at him intently. You, uh, you okay? Charlie asked awkwardly. The private shook his head slowly. Yeah, man. I just never seen anybody read like that, he said, motioning to the book. Oh, Charlie replied with a laugh, patting the book. Little speed reading technique I picked up while studying for my PhD. Garrett's brow furrowed. Doesn't that take away from some of the fun of the story? he asked. It does, but I know this one well, Charlie said, smiling down at the book. It was one of my favorites growing up, and I reread it every year or so. Figured that since this might be my last few days on this planet, I might as well give it another read. Garrett leaned forward curiously. What's it called? he asked. It's a pulp sci-fi novel from the fifties called Day of the Demon, Charlie said, holding up the book and showing off the well-worn cover. Despite how beat up it was, it still showed the cover of a busty, screaming woman with demonic faces looming behind her. Sounds... evil, Garrett quipped. Nah, nothing like that, Charlie replied. It's about these creatures from beyond that take control of humans and turn them into their slaves. They start out in a small town and spread to bigger cities, infecting as they go. So basically, the opposite of our undead friends below, who started out big and spread from there. Garrett nodded thoughtfully. So who wins? he asked. Nobody really does, in the end, Charlie said. The demons are trying to take things over, but at the end of the book a group of civilians expose their plot before they can. The private cocked a brow. Sounds like we won, then, he said. I think that's how the author wanted it to be, Charlie replied. But I didn't see it that way. Garrett shrugged. Why not? he asked. Think about it, Charlie said. If you found out a significant portion of the population was controlled by an evil force, what do you think would happen? I doubt that the demons would simply shrug their shoulders and walk away. Violence, wars, society falling apart, all of that would follow. The private nodded slowly. Yeah, I can see that, he said thoughtfully. Still, sounds like some grim reading material, given what the world has become. Charlie chuckled. Yeah, you're right. It's not exactly the most light-hearted of tales, he agreed. But it brings back some good memories, which is what I'm reading it for. I have some movies like that, Garrett said. Would be nice to see those again. They're getting the hydro plant back up and running, Charlie said. Should have it going pretty strong soon. Wouldn't surprise me if we had power by the time we get back from this mission. The private laughed. Not just gotta track down the movies, he drawled. I tell you what, you watch my back out there and I'll do my best to track down any movie you want, Charlie offered. They're starting to bring some into the city, and I know a few people who are volunteering to sort them. Garrett grinned. All right, Doc, you have a deal, he said, and extended a hand. Sounds good, Charlie said, and shook his hand. But before he could let go, he winced. I'm sorry, your name is escaping me at the moment. Private Garrett the private said. And don't worry about it, more of us than there are of you. Plus, you're a VIP, so we're kind of required to know your name. He smiled slyly, and the doctor groaned, laughing as he shook his head. Yeah, I'm not living the VIP thing down for quite a while, am I? He asked helplessly. No, you are not, Garrett confirmed. The intercom beeped on, and Cohen's voice came through the tinny speaker. This is your captain speaking, he drawled. Please put your tray tables up and your seats in the upright position, because we will be landing momentarily. Everybody buckled their seat belts as they started their descent. Charlie looked out the window at the wilderness and not much of anything else, save for a couple of roads heading into the distance. We are on the clock, so once we land, we'd better move like it. Wrangle's voice came through the intercom next. 
Cohen, you're with the plane, since you're the only one who can fly us out of here. Reed, you take Preston and Lyons to find the fuel truck and get this thing topped off. Bernard, you're with me. We're going to hit the offices and see what we can find. Garrett, you're babysitting the VIP until we know it's clear. Do not set foot outside this plane until you get the thumbs up. Everybody yelled, Yes, sir, towards the cockpit as they came in for a landing. As the plane bumped down the strip, they looked out the windows. There were a couple of straggler zombies out near the hangar at the far end of the strip. It was a tiny airport, just a lone hangar and an office building near the middle of the runway. Cohen stopped about a hundred yards short of the hangar, about halfway between it and the office building. As soon as the engine was off, Lyons cracked open the door and jumped out, immediately pulling out a machete from his leg sheath. Everybody but Garrett and Charlie piled out, and Wrangle shut the door behind them. You know what to do, the sergeant said. Let's move. Reed, Preston, and Lyons jogged off towards the hangar, each with a blade in their hands. Preston clanked his machete off of the ground a few times while letting out a bit of a yell to get the zombies' attention. About six corpses staggered outside, moaning and reaching as they shambled towards the trio. To each, Lyons quipped. Let's wreck em. The trio spread out a bit, luring the zombies in various directions. They were spread out pretty thin, allowing the soldiers to make quick work of them with little threat to their well-being. A few stabs and slashes later, and they were all down. They looked around, not seeing any other movement. Well, that was easy, Preston said. Come on, let's find that fuel truck, Reed urged, and they took off running. Over at the office building, which was barely more than three rooms big, Wrangell and Bernard rushed over to the front door. Wrangell pulled on the swinging glass door, finding it unlocked. You ready? he asked. Bernard nodded sharply. Let's do it, Sarge, he said, his knife at the ready. Wrangell pulled open the door and Bernard rushed inside, quickly sweeping the entryway, which was completely empty. The sergeant moved through to the office door on the right, which was closed. He gave it a knock and heard some movement on the other side. Got a live one here, he called. I'll check the other door, Bernard replied. He went to the other door, giving it a light rap and hearing nothing. He shook his head and then cracked it open, looking inside at a break room with some grocery bags on the table. Wrangle listened to his door harder, but he could only hear one set of footsteps, and it wasn't getting too much closer. He cracked open the door and then pushed it the rest of the way at the sight of a well-dressed zombie at the far end of the room, trapped behind its desk. Wrangle leaned over and stabbed it in the head, taking it out easily. Clear in here, he called and looked around the small office, seeing nothing of value. He shoved the corpse from the desk and checked the drawers, but found nothing useful. Hey, Sarge, Bernard called. I might have something here. Wrangle walked into the next room, finding the private leaning against the counter and munching on crackers he'd pulled from one of the grocery bags. Break time already? the sergeant asked dryly. More in there if you want, Bernard replied, motioning to the table. Wrangle rummaged around in the bag and dug around for a moment before pulling out a bag of chips. He checked the expiration date and then shrugged. I'll risk it, he quipped and tore it open. Good find. Bernard shrugged. This is just a bonus, he said, and then held out a receipt. The sergeant's brow furrowed as he crunched some chips and took the receipt. You think we have an expense report? he asked. Look at the address, Bernard prompted before shoving another handful of crackers into his mouth. Alturas, Wrangle asked, shrugging. What about it? Bernard pointed to a map on the wall of the local area. It looked like something they'd pulled off of a website satellite map, with lines drawn on it branching out from the airport to show how far away they were to various places. Alturas was on that map, with a note of twenty miles. That's one hell of a hike, Wrangle said, popping a chip into his mouth. Bernard held up a set of car keys dangling around them. Found them next to the groceries, he said. According to the date on the receipt, they went shopping the morning all hell broke loose. Probably the zombie in the other room there. Nice deduction skills, Wrangle said, 
waving an arm over the grocery bags. So you want to go on a food run? Sarge, I know we're in California, and it goes against all logic, but we're in rural California, Bernard pointed out. Town that small, away from civilization? I bet you another bag of chips that somebody in that town has guns. Maybe a general store with some ammo? The sergeant looked down at his watch at the countdown, sucking in his cheeks as he thought hard about it. Sarge, math ain't my strong suit, but even I know that seven bullets each ain't gonna do diddly shit against the numbers we're walking into, Bernard said. Now you said we had time to play around with. Doesn't this seem like a worthy use of that time? Wrangle finally gave in, nodding. Okay, twenty minutes there, forty minutes to search, twenty minutes back, he conceded. Back in the air within an hour and a half. Let's do it, Bernard said, raising his hand in a victory fist. They headed back outside where the fuel truck was just backing into position. Cohen was taking the lead in fueling the plane, while Garrett and Charlie stood nearby, stretching their legs. Lions, you're with Bernard and me, Wrangle said. Reed cocked his head, turning towards them. What's up, Sarge? he asked. We're going on an ammo hunt. Wrangle explained. Got a small town twenty minutes away. He held up the keys and jingled them. And got a ride. Charlie crossed his arms nervously. Sergeant, just know that my five-hour estimate could be off, he said. Don't worry, Doc, we'll be wheels up in ninety, Wrangle replied. Bernard nodded. And trust me, you're going to want us to have bullets when this shit gets heavy, he added. Charlie nodded reluctantly. I trust your judgment, Sergeant, he said. Let's move, Wrangle instructed, and led Lyons and Bernard around the back side of the office building, where they found a large luxury SUV in the executive parking spot. As they peeked inside to make sure it was empty, Bernard let out an impressed whistle from the back end. Hell of a vehicle, right? Lyons asked. Bernard laughed. Not what I was whistling at, he said, and waved them over. The others walked to the trunk and saw him pointing to the license plate. It was a vanity plate that read, Was His. They marveled at it for a moment, breaking into laughter. Wow, that bitch was so cold she shit icicles, Wrangle quipped, and they laughed some more as they got into the vehicle. Chapter 5 Wrangle drove the high-end SUV towards town, passing a sign reading Alturas, population 2,237. Big enough to have what we need, Bernard said from the passenger seat, and small enough to allow us to get it. Lyons leaned forward from the back. Good job jinxing us, dumbass, he accused. Any town with a population bigger than twenty could be a problem for us especially with how pathetic our loadout is. You just need to get better at blades there, bud, Bernard quipped. Lyons drew his blade, playfully pointing it at his friend. We survive this mission? The two of us are having a throw-off, he warned. I can guarantee tea I'll top you. More to being good with a blade than just throwing it, Bernard quipped. Lyons rolled his eyes. Spoken like a man who knows he's already beaten, he shot back. They shared a chuckle as Wrangle slowed down. They stopped just outside of the start of town, looking down the main road. There was a neighborhood to the left of them that looked like it had a few streets and blocks. Straight ahead led to a big curve to the left about half a mile down, with a business-looking building at the edge of it that the road vanished behind. So, what's the place, Arge? Lyons asked. I doubt we're going to be lucky enough to find a gun store in a town this size, Wrangle replied thoughtfully. Then we look for a general store, or even a western store, Bernard suggested. Lyons cocked a brow. A western store? he asked dryly. You know, a place that sells cowboy and farmer shit, Bernard replied, whirling a hand in the air. Boots, work clothes, farm feed, those places usually have an ammo selection. Okay, I'm taking it slow, Wrangle said. Keep your eyes peeled. He started moving again, 
keeping the speed at ten miles per hour so that the engine noise was low. They looked into the neighborhood to their left, seeing some light zombie activity, but they were spread out pretty far. At most, there were only three or four ghouls to a pack. That's a good sign, Bernard said. Wrangle came around a curve, but quickly stopped at the sight of a couple hundred zombies in the road. What did I fucking tell you about jinxing us, man? Lyons barked. Yeah, that's my bad, Bernard admitted sheepishly. The downtown area had rows of tightly packed business buildings on either side of the road, stretching five blocks. The zombies were packed around a storefront three blocks down, facing left, all trying to get in. Back a plan? Wrangle asked. Maybe check the neighborhood? Bernard suggested. Rural place like this, somebody's got to be packing. Works for me, the sergeant said, and popped the SUV into reverse. Hang on, Sarge, Lyons said, and Wrangle paused. What is it? he asked. Lyons pointed to the one-story building on the right, next to a two-story with a ladder on the side. We've come this far, he said. You might as well make it worth our while. If there's a store with ammo, we should know about it. Pull up to the side of that building on the corner. I'll scout it out. Wrangle and Bernard exchanged a look and shrugged. All right, Lyons, the sergeant agreed. But for the love of God, stay out of sight. I'd feel really guilty if I had to leave you here. The private chuckled. Ain't got to tell me twice, he said. Wrangle drove to the side of the building slowly, almost coasting to keep the noise to a minimum. Bernard, watch that mob like they're after your girl, he instructed firmly. You see even one of them come this way, you tell me. You got it, Sarge, Bernard agreed. Wrangle parked beside the building, and Lyons quickly hopped out. He clambered up onto the hood, and that gave him just enough height to reach the top of the building. He hauled himself up over the lip, rolling over and then quickly popping up, surveying the area in the unlikely event that there was a zombie on the roof. Once he saw it was clear, he moved quickly to the ladder, scaling it in a matter of seconds and peeking over the top to make sure it was clear, which it was. He moved cautiously to the edge of the building, seeing the stores on the other side of the street. Restaurant, clothing, jewelry, he muttered. Damn, nothing of value. He moved far away from the edge before continuing down the street. He reached the final building on the block, still a block away from the horde of zombies. He laid down and pulled out a metal scope so he could get a better look. He scanned the next block, again seeing nothing of value. For such a small town, they have some nice shopping options, he thought. But not what I need. Come on, where are the guns and bullets? He looked over to the mob, scanning it over and moving the scope up the buildings. Down, down the block. Another restaurant, he thought as he moved his eyes. Coffee shop. And the mob is at... Fuck my life. Exasperated. Lyons lowered the scope, shaking his head and pinching the bridge of his nose. Of course, that's the Western store. He pulled up the scope again, scanning the front of the building. Several of the giant windows were broken out and zombies moved in and out freely. It seemed as though the ones inside were clattering around and creating constant noise, and that was what was keeping the mob there. This should be interesting, Lyons murmured to himself and then carefully turned around, rushing back to the SUV quietly. He climbed down and got into the back seat. What's the verdict? Wrangle asked. Good news is, I found your western store, the private replied. Bad news is, so did the zombies. That ain't no big deal, Bernard replied, shaking his head. We can just sneak in through the back door. We'll be in and out before they even know we're there. Lyons rolled his eyes. Unfortunately, this situation isn't like your ex-girlfriend, but he drawled. They'll know when we're inside. Bernard shook his head, disappointed in himself that he'd set himself up like that. Motherfucker, he muttered. Why would they know? Wrangle asked. A couple of the front windows are busted out, Lyons explained. Big display jobs. They're flowing in and out like it's a Black Friday sale. Wrangle sighed. Shit, he said. So we're going with the neighborhood? Bernard asked. 
The sergeant sat there quietly, mentally weighing the risk versus the potential rewards. Bernard, how confident are you that there's ammunition in there? He finally asked. Every one of those small-town western stores I've ever set foot in had a cage with ammunition. The private replied with a shrug. Most of them have been locked up. Nothing too major, but padlocked. Lyons leaned over the back seat and into the trunk, reaching in to lift up the cover in the back. Beneath lay a square tire and maintenance kit, and he took a hold of the tire iron, lifting it and waving it back and forth. He handed it up into the front seat. That should handle your padlock problem, if you encounter it, he said. Great. Now we just need a plan to take out a few hundred zombies, Bernard replied with a sigh. Shouldn't be too difficult with the twenty-one bullets we have between us. Don't have to kill them, Wrangle pointed out. Just need them to go away for a few minutes. We get enough of them out of the store and away from the front, and we can get in, get what we need, and get out. Lyons glanced down towards the back of the building he'd just climbed, spotting a wooden privacy fence a couple of yards away, leading to a field. Sarge, pull up to the other side of that fence, he said, motioning. Wrangle drove over there, coming around the corner into the vacant land. There were some buildings in the distance, a couple of blocks down, that looked like storage. A few zombies wandered near it, but they were too far to pay them any attention. Perfect, Lyons said. The sergeant cocked a brow. Sounds like you have an idea, he said. Why don't you share with the rest of the class? That last building on the other side of the block is the perfect vantage point and distance away from the mob. Lyons explained. I can get up there and pull them my way. Sacrifice a couple of bullets to get their attention. Might not pull all of the ones out of the store, but should make the ones inside manageable. You two go in, get what we need, and when you give me the signal, I'll run back, hop the fence from the building, and come pick you up. The other two exchanged a look and then shrugged. Better than anything I have, Bernard admitted. Wrangle nodded slowly. And I've certainly gone into battle with less of a plan, he agreed. We should be able to get to the neighborhood behind the downtown area. Pick us up two blocks up. He glanced at his watch. If we're going to do it, let's do it. Time's a-wasting. He pulled the SUV off of the road and parked it behind the fence, leaving the keys in the ignition. What you parking back here for? Bernard asked. Lyons raised a hand. On the off-chance zombies show up at this side of the building... It would make it difficult for me to get inside, he explained. Bernard nodded. Yeah, I guess, he agreed. Wrangle leaned towards his communicator. Check one, he said. Check two. His voice came through clearly, and both soldiers confirmed they could hear him, also responding in kind. Lions, get into position and wait on our signal, the sergeant explained. You're our eyes, so you tell us when we can move. You got it, Sarge. Lyons replied. The three men got out of the SUV and headed back over to the one-story building. Wrangle and Bernard boosted Lyons up so he could get onto the roof. The duo on the ground moved to the edge of the building, looking down towards the mob and making sure they were well out of sight before moving. They darted across the street, getting to the other row of buildings and pausing by the alley. As they looked down, they spotted a few zombies scattered about spread pretty far apart, with groups no more than two together. A wooden privacy fence a few yards away loomed from the back, just wide enough for a small car to drive down. Both Wrangle and Bernard drew their knives, walking with a deliberate pace and staying as quiet as they could. Each of them killed a zombie on that block, gently laying the corpses on the ground after stabbing them so they didn't make any noise. When they reached the next block, they looked up towards the building where Lyons was set up. He spotted them and got a thumbs up, giving the signal he was ready for them to get into position. The duo worked their way down the next block, slicing and dicing half a dozen ghouls as they went. They dispatched them with ease, barely recognizing them as a threat. At the next block, Wrangle took the front and approached the corner soundlessly. He peeked around towards the road seeing some straggler zombies that were far away from the mob. A few wandered about, looking in various directions. Wrangle knew that if they were spotted, it would be deep trouble. The moans coming from the mob were fairly loud, even though they were half a block down. 
The voices joined together in an echoing hum. The sergeant looked down for some inspiration and spotted a discarded glass beer bottle. He picked it up, readying it in his hand, and then glancing back at Bernard and giving him a nod to let him know he needed to be ready to move. He stepped out, emerging halfway behind the building and reared back, throwing it high and far. He ducked back behind cover, listening for the crash, which was barely audible over the constant moaning. He peeked out just as the zombies in the intersection grew distracted, turning towards the noise. The men darted across the street, getting to cover before the ghouls looked back in their direction. Wrangle carefully peeked back around the corner, relieved that they weren't being followed. They moved up to the back of the store, and Wrangle gently squeezed the handle release, heading the latch on hook. He nodded to Bernard, keeping his hand on the handle as he clicked on his communicator. All right, Lions, you're on, he murmured. Let us know when we can move. Copy that, Lyons said, and stood up, pulling out his rifle and aiming towards the mob. He squeezed off a shot, followed quickly by another one. Yo, over here, he bellowed. Fresh meat, motherfuckers! A lot of the zombies in front of the store turned towards the noise, taking notice of the screaming man on top of the building. They moaned excitedly and shambled in his direction. What started as a trickle quickly became a flood as the movement and moans moving away from the storefront attracted others from the front of the building. Within a minute, the entire horde was moving towards his position. He continued to yell and scream as the ghouls walked towards him. He pulled out his scope, looking towards the front of the building. There were several zombies coming out of the store through the broken windows, but not as many as he wanted. This continued for several minutes until the ghouls were finally all over to his side of the building. Yeah, that's right, he yelled. Line up to get a taste. He looked back towards the front of the store where only a single zombie shambled out into the street. It took a few steps outside before turning around like something inside had caught its attention and staggered back in through the window. Lyons grunted and hit his communicator. Sarge, I think that's as good as you're going to get it, he said. You're going to have hostiles inside, and I don't know how many. The last one came out and then heard something that pulled it back in. Copy that, Lyons, Wrangle replied. Good work. Let you know when we're clear. Copy, Lyons replied. Good luck. He looked down at the mob below him, reaching up with hungry faces and open mouths. I swear I could go the rest of my life without seeing a mob like this reaching up at me he muttered to himself. The view is bad enough, but Jesus, the smell? He wrinkled his nose and shook his head, waving his hand in front of his face as if he could wave away the rot. Behind the store, Wrangle and Bernard readied themselves to go inside. Both had their knives at the ready as the latter clicked open the door and pulled. A zombie immediately reached for them, Wrangle grabbed it by the shirt and stabbed it in the side of the head before it could grasp Bernard. Both men breathed heavily from the scare, rattled, and did a quick sweep of the back room, finding it thankfully empty. The sergeant nodded to his companion to make sure he was okay, and Bernard nodded back jerkily, raising his weapon at the ready. Wrangle led them into the dark storeroom, the only light coming from the ones behind them. There were boxes and piles of goods everywhere, pushed against the walls. In the center was a makeshift camping area, a sleeping bag on the ground and some prepackaged food next to a dead camping light. Upon closer inspection, the sleeping bag was soaked with blood. The door to the main shop was barricaded with boxes, and Bernard shook his head. Poor bastard didn't have a chance, he murmured. Got bit and tried to sleep it off. Wrangle put his finger to his lips and then pointed to the barricade. They silently crept over and hauled the heavy boxes out of the way as quickly as they could. Once it was clear, Wrangle cracked the door open and peeked outside into the showroom. There were counters on either side of the entrance with showcases, giving them very little cover. The light coming from the front windows was enough to show a couple dozen zombies moving about inside the store. Displays had been knocked over, some clearing in the middle where several zombies moaned and thrashed about. 
Wrangle scanned the walls he could see, but wasn't able to spot any ammunition. He gently shut the door and kept his voice barely audible, hovering his lips right next to Bernard's ear. Doesn't look like the cage is on the left or right walls, he whispered. Gotta be on the back wall. We have cover just outside the door to either side, but be quiet when you move. This place is crawling with those things. Bernard nodded and then adjusted so he was speaking into the sergeant's ear. You go left, I go right, he whispered back. Wrangle nodded. Works for me, he said. When we find it, you focus on getting it open. I'll handle anything that comes our way. Bag it up and get out. Bernard nodded. Damn straight, he said. Let's do this. The sergeant slowly pushed on the door and they crept into the store, staying low. Bernard moved to the left and nearly bonked into the back of a zombie. He wasted no time delivering a knife strike to the back of its head, pulling it back towards him so he could gently lay the corpse on the ground. There was very little noise, but it was enough to get Wrangle's attention, who turned to see what happened. Their eyes locked once the immediate threat was taken care of, and Bernard widened his eyes in a clear, Can you believe this shit? Wrangle signaled back to keep looking, and they went back to the mission at hand. They stayed low, out of sight as they moved along the back wall. Bernard struck out on his side, finding nothing but clothing and shoe stock along the wall. Wrangle had better luck, finding the cage at the corner of the store. It wasn't very big, maybe a yard wide, stretching from floor to ceiling. He peeked over the top of the counter towards the showroom, making sure no zombies were within his eyeline. When he saw it was clear, he stood up and inspected the lock. It was a padlock connected to a metal loop holding the cage closed. Wrangle looked through the bars at the moderately stocked shelf. There were a few boxes of 9mm bullets and a few boxes of shotgun shells to go along with a lone pump-action shotgun. Better than nothing, he thought and then ducked back down, looking towards Bernard to finish his sweep so he would turn around. Once the private turned back towards him, Wrangle waved him over. Bernard quickly shuffled through the back of the store, crossing over the opening aisle for the door. As he did so, a couple of zombies moaned and shambled towards the back, and he growled as he quickly made a beeline for his sergeant. They saw me, Bernard whispered. Wrangle nodded. I'll handle it, he replied. You just get this cage open. Bernard peered into the cage and then looked up at the lock. As soon as I go to work on it, they're going to be on us, he warned. I'll handle it. You just get to work, Wrangle assured him. He looked behind the counter and found a large duffel bag. Load it up in this and be ready to move. Don't forget the shotguns. Bernard nodded, pulling the tire iron from his belt as Wrangle moved over to the aisle between the counters. One of the two zombies shambling towards them was within striking distance as he got there. It let out a loud, excited moan at the sight of the sergeant, but it was short-lived as it took a knife shot right to the eye. Wrangle tried to catch the body as it fell to minimize the noise, but its shirt ripped away as he grabbed it. The ghoul slammed into a nearby display, sending metal stakes clattering to the ground. The room was immediately filled with excited moans and footsteps all headed straight for him. Get that case open, he barked. Bernard glanced over his shoulder and upon seeing the chaos that was about to unfold, redoubled his effort to pry open the lock without worrying about making noise at this point. He jammed the open end of the tire iron through the lock, letting out a grunt as he strained to pry it open, but to no avail. Wrangle stabbed a zombie in the head and then kicked it backwards into a display, sending it to the ground with another ghoul. He looked across the room, seeing a couple dozen zombies shuffling towards him. The closest was about ten yards away, several spread out, all converging on him. Wrangle looked around frantically for something to help, spotting a long wooden display table. He rushed over, kicking a corpse out of the way before grabbing it. He put all his weight into it, dragging it across the floor. The table was a couple of yards long and heavy, made of solid wood. Wrangle struggled but managed to get it moving most of the way in front of the aisle, but still a couple of yards away from the counter. He tried to slide it back, but zombies reached him before he could. 
He reached down and grabbed a couple of the metal stakes that fell to the ground earlier, grabbing a few of them. He immediately started attacking with them, jamming them into eye sockets one by one, corpse after corpse slumping on the table. After a couple of strikes, more zombies reached the table. Dozens of arms swung about, all reaching for Wrangle as he struggled to deliver another kill shot. As the zombies in front of the table made life difficult, a few started to come around the side. The sergeant jammed his final strike into the eyeball of a rotted corpse to his right, kicking it so that it fell into the ones behind it. He turned around quickly and stabbed the face of another zombie that was coming up behind him, before shoving it down as well. He whirled back towards the table, facing the recovering ghouls. Get that case open! he screamed. Bernard let out a primal scream, straining to pop the lock, and finally it gave way. Got it! he cried, and threw the cage open, shoveling every box of ammo he could into the large shopping bag. Once he cleared the shelves, he grabbed the two shotguns and started running back towards the door. As he went, he realized Wrangle was fighting furiously, stabbing and kicking zombies before turning and doing the same to the ones coming up from behind. He couldn't help but take a breath to revel in the sergeant fighting a two-front war, and doing it extremely well. I got it! Let's go, Sarge! Bernard bellowed. Wrangle took out one more ghoul before grabbing it by the shirt and tossing it into the others coming up from behind him. He darted away from the table, and then blew past Bernard, rushing into the back room. Bernard slammed the door of the stockroom shut behind him. That was fun, he quipped. Wrangle shook his head. Not out of this. As if on cue, a zombie staggered in the doorway from the alleyway and into the storeroom. Yet, the sergeant finished dryly, and rushed up, stabbing the corpse and throwing it to the side. The duo stepped outside, where zombies came at them from both directions in the alley. What now, Sarge? Bernard asked. The zombies were still a good fifteen yards away, giving them at least a few beats to plot their next move. Wrangle smacked his communicator. Lions, we're out and heading to the neighborhood, he said. Move your ass. Copy that, came the reply. The sergeant looked at the privacy fence, running over to it and peering through the small cracks between the planks. It was a small field before the neighborhood, and he couldn't see any movement on that side. Up and over, let's go, he barked. Bernard tossed the weapons and bag over the fence as the two men backed up to get a running start. They rushed over, leaping up and managing to pull themselves over, landing hard on the ground as the zombies closed in on them. They landed and immediately scanned the area, not seeing any zombies between them and the neighborhood. Grab the stuff and let's move. Wrangle instructed. Lions ran across the top of the buildings, trying to get to the SUV before the zombies figured out which direction he was going. When he reached the two-story building, he quickly slid down the ladder to the roof of the one-story building on the corner. He ran over to the edge, looking down and seeing a handful of zombies both behind the building and to the side. Where the fuck did you come from? Lions muttered and then glanced along the alley. So much for my plan of jumping straight down. There were about half a dozen ghouls on either side of the building. Lyons looked to the fence across the alley, and the grass beneath it. He let out a deep sigh, knowing it was going to be a rough landing with the cold weather. Not much of a choice, he grunted. Suck it up, man. He took a beat to psych himself up, and then took a few steps back. He rushed forward, planting his foot on the edge of the roof and pushing off as hard as he could. He got enough height and distance to clear the fence, landing hard on the ground and rolling to cut off some of the impact. Lyons got the wind knocked out of him as he rolled over to his back, coughing and gasping for air. As this happened, he forced himself to get up, knowing the sound was going to attract attention. He hustled over to the SUV as the moans from the other side of the fence intensified. Several hands smacked the wood as he crawled into the driver's side. Once he was safely inside, he managed to finally catch his breath, just in time for zombies to come around the corner and smack the back window. This startled him and got him moving, starting up the SUV and hitting the gas. In the vehicle, headed your way, 
he said into his communicator. Copy that, Wrangle came back. We're two blocks up. Just drive down the street until you see us. The calm went dead and Wrangle looked around the neighborhood, seeing a few zombies in every direction, but none within a dangerous distance at least. He's on the way, the sergeant said. Good, Bernard replied, looking around at the houses, spotting a large beat-up pickup truck with several hunting-related stickers on the back. Sarge, check it out, he said as he motioned towards the vehicle. Wrangle cocked a brow. That's what I love about you, he drawled, always wanting more. The duo rushed over to the house looking in through the windows, but they couldn't see much through the pulled curtains. Even in the spots they could see through the fabric, it was hard to tell what was inside due to the lack of light. Can't see shit, Bernard said. Me either, Wrangle replied. The private jerked a thumb over his shoulder. I can try around back, he offered. Do it, Wrangle said. Just be quick, we're on the clock. Bernard ran around the house, checking the windows as he went. But all of them were the same. Curtains closed. When he reached the back, he spotted a sliding glass door with the curtain pulled open ever so slightly. Finally, he muttered, and peeked inside, the light shining through to the living room. He couldn't see much, but he did spot a gun rack hanging over the mantel, with a few guns up there. Hell yeah, he rushed around to the front of the house. Got a gun rack, he reported. Loaded? Wrangle asked. The private shrugged. Can't tell what it is, but there's something on there, he replied. Wrangle nodded. Let's get it then he said, and approached the front door. They tried to open it, but it was locked up tight. The sergeant moved to kick it, but then noticed it had several deadbolts, forcing him to stop. How's the back looking? he asked. Glass door? Bernard replied. Wrangle nodded. Let's move, he said, and then hit his communicator. Lions, we're going into a house, big hunter's pickup out front. Bag on the front porch. Copy that, Lions replied. The soldiers rushed to the back, guns at the ready. They got there and immediately used the butt of their rifles to punch a hole in the glass, allowing them to reach inside and unlock the sliding door. Wrangle slid it open, and they raced inside, drawing their knives. Immediately, several zombies accosted them in the kitchen, a whole family of them. The sergeant went after the biggest one to his left, what had once been a burly man of easily three hundred pounds. Its arms flailed about, causing Wrangle a little bit of difficulty in delivering a kill shot, but he finally managed to stab it in the skull. Bernard took on two female zombies, picking up the smaller one and tossing it across the table on the right. The other lunged forward to take a bite out of his arm, and he yanked his limb away, causing the zombie to trip and fall forward, smacking its face hard into the linoleum floor. Bitch, don't you try to bite me! Bernard snapped, momentarily enraged and losing his focus. He dropped down to one knee and stabbed the corpse several times in the head, in a full frenzy. Fuck you! Die, die! Wrangle shoved another corpse away from him and whirled on his partner. Bernard, get it together, he barked. The private stabbed the ghoul one more time in the head and then spat on it, letting out a primal yell of dominance. And then searing pain in his calf. He looked down in shock at the zombie he'd thrown, which had crawled up behind him on the floor, holding his leg in a death grip. He screamed as its rotted, broken teeth sank into his flesh, and the zombie ripped a significant chunk of his limb away. He killed it instantly with a solid blow, but it was too late, and he knew it was too late. He threw the corpse away with the knife still buried in it, and rolled over on his back, letting out a pissed-off bellow. Wrangle approached once he killed his zombie's eyes wide. Bernard, are you? The fucking bitch bit me, the private yelled. I can't believe she fucking bit me. Hey, I'm here. Where are you guys at? Lions came through the communicator. Wrangle clicked his on slowly. Come around back, he said, voice somber. Bernard's down. The line went dead as the sergeant stood over his companion, helplessly watching his friend and comrade spit obscenities as he held his mortal leg wound. Lyons skidded to a stop next to them, 
What the fuck happened? He blurted. I got fucking careless, that's what happened, Bernard cried. He smacked the floor a few times in frustration, and the others didn't know what to say. Wrangle finally took a deep breath, remembering where they were standing. Lions, clear the rest of the house, he instructed, and watch yourself. Yes, sir, Lions replied, taking another long, terrified look at his fallen friend and tearing off. Wrangle knelt down, putting his hand on his soldier's shoulder. I need you to let me see it, he said softly. Bernard nodded, still fuming, but his eyes betraying his pure fear. The sergeant looked at the wound. It was mangled, quite deep, with half of the calf muscle ripped out. Wrangle reached over to the counter, grabbing a dish towel and using it to try to stop the bleeding. Hold it right there. I'll find something to patch it up with, he said. You don't have time for that, Sarge, Bernard said, voice resigned. We're going to make time, Wrangle growled. Bernard shook his head vehemently. No, you're not, he snapped. My adrenaline is still pumping, so I can walk on it for a little bit. Get the guns and get out of here. We ain't leaving you behind, Lyons declared from the doorway, voice thick. Yeah, you are, Bernard replied. By the time we get to Edwards, I won't be able to walk. I'm a lot of things, but I'll be damned if I'm going to be dead weight. Wrangle glanced over his shoulder. Get the guns, he instructed. See if there's any ammo and take that too. Sarge? Lyons asked hoarsely. Just do it, Wrangle snapped. Bernard gave the private a nod, and all Lyons could do was let out a frustrated grunt. Guess we'll have to put off that knife contest for another day, huh? He asked, but he couldn't make eye contact with his fallen friend. Bernard let out a tired laugh. If you're smart and don't lose focus like I did, it won't be for a while, he said. I better not see your ass in the afterlife for a good thirty, forty years. That might give you enough time to practice to beat me, Lyons replied, offering a smile, though strained. They shared a forced laugh before Wrangle gave him a nod to get moving, and he finally left the room. We can take you back to the airport, the sergeant offered. Lots of food in that office. Bernard shook his head. Doubt I'm going to have much of an appetite, he said. Plus, it would just take time away from diving into that. He inclined his head towards a stack of liquor bottles on the counter. Wrangle chuckled, shaking his head. There are worse ways to go out of this world, he said. Here's hoping you don't see any of them on this mission, Bernard replied, finally relaxing his shoulders. Wrangle shook his hand and gave his shoulder a hard squeeze. I'll see you next time around, he said. Bernard nodded, watching his sergeant leave, and then hobbled over to the liquor, sifting through the bottles before finding a full bottle of twenty-year-old scotch. He popped open the top and took a deep whiff. At least something is going right today, he murmured to himself, and then made his way to a nearby recliner. He shoved it so that it faced the window overlooking the backyard, and collapsed into it before taking a deep swig of the delicious drink. As the smooth burn in his throat soothed the deadly burn in his calf, he took solace in the fact that he was about to enjoy something that he never would have been able to afford in the real world. He shoved away the thought that it was the last thing he would ever do in this life. Chapter 6 47 Hours Until Meltdown The entire flight to Edwards Air Force Base was spent in near-complete silence, with only the occasional murmur from the soldiers as they prepped their newfound ammunition supply. A supply they'd felt they essentially traded their comrade for. They loaded up magazines, separated out bullets, and checked the weapons to make sure they were good to go. The hall was adequate, with two new pump-action shotguns, three hunting rifles with various scopes, and several boxes of ammo for each. But even with the new firepower, the morale was low due to the shocking loss of Private Bernard. All right, everybody buckle up back there, Cohen came over the intercom. We're going to be coming in for a landing in a minute, and it might get bumpy. I can see some movement on the runway and all around the base. 
Wrangle's voice was next. Which means we're going to be coming in hot, he added. As soon as this thing comes to a stop, I want Preston and Reed out the door to secure the perimeter. Anything within ten yards gets blasted. Anything further than that we'll handle with blades once we get out there. Understood? There was a chorus of half-hearted, Yes, sir, and the sergeant let out a frustrated growl. All right, y'all, listen the fuck up, Wrangle said firmly. I know it sucks about Bernard, but we have a job to do. We all knew the risks coming out here, just like every other mission we've run. Now, when we get through this, we'll pour a few drinks in his honor. But until then, put it out of your mind and focus. Last thing we need is another fuck up. The men nodded and let out more emphatic affirmative responses. There were a few clicks as they got their weapons ready. All right, here we go. Cohen announced, and the plane went into landing mode, descending towards the runway. The noise got the zombies on the ground excited, causing them to look around for the source. As they went, Wrangle leaned over to the pilot. This thing is going to be okay if we hit a zombie or two, right? he asked. Cohen tilted his head back and forth. As long as one doesn't hit the engine, it should be okay, he replied. What happens if it hits the engine? Wrangle asked. Cohen shrugged. Hope you like hitchhiking, he replied dryly. The sergeant let out a deep breath. Make sure it doesn't hit the engine, he said. Cohen nodded and intently focused on his landing. The zombies were spread out pretty well on the runway, with most of them congregating near the hangars and buildings. However, a few had wandered into the path of the plane. He pulled up a little. Hang on, this is going to be rough he barked. He cleared a couple of ghouls before bringing the plane down hard onto the runway. As soon as the tires hit, he slammed on the brakes, pulling back the engine to slow down. Even with the deceleration, there were a few impacts on the wings as corpses were decapitated by the fast-moving metal. Wrangle let out a bellow, gripping his gun with white knuckles. We're still good! We're still good! Cohen cried. The plane slowed to a crawl near the end of the runway as he turned it back towards the base, getting it off of the runway. There were several hangars nearby, as well as office buildings and barracks. Where to, Sarge? Cohen asked. Wrangle unwrapped his fingers from his weapon and motioned out the window. Pull it up to the other side of the hangar, he instructed. Hopefully we'll have a good view of a gas truck. The pilot drove the plane off of the runway and around the hangar, making some wide turns to avoid hitting more zombies. Finally, they made it to the other side, and he shut things down. As soon as they were stopped, Reed and Preston leapt out the door, slamming it behind them. The two soldiers raised their handguns, immediately firing off a few shots at the closest ghouls. The bullets were on target, ripping through their heads quickly. They scanned the immediate area and didn't see any others within thirty yards. However, there were about a dozen spread out that lumbered towards them, easily over a hundred yards. Okay, we're good, Reed said and smacked the door. Wrangle, Lyons, and Garrett got out of the plane, leaving Cohen and Charlie inside. Okay, we're going to go find a fuel truck, the sergeant said through the door. You two just sit tight and wait for us to come back. I'm on calm if there is any problem. Copy that, Sarge. Cohen replied as he took a seat next to Charlie. Wrangle nodded and shut the plane door, securing it before walking over to the group. Garrett handed him a shotgun, keeping one for himself. Everyone else opted for handguns and knives. No clue where the fuel truck is going to be, the sergeant said. Reed, you and Preston hop over a row and go up. I'll take Garrett and Lyons to the other side of the runway and move up. Move silently if you can and speak up when you find one. Reed and Preston nodded before taking off. Wrangle and his team broke away, heading around the building towards the runway. There were a few zombies near the front of the building, and the soldiers casually jogged over and stabbed with blades for silent kills. They looked up the runway at the smattering of ghouls lumbering towards them. Come on, let's get across, Wrangle said. The trio ran across the runway towards the row of buildings on the other side, which included a hangar directly across from them, and a string of offices and barracks stretching to the far end of the runway. As they approached the hangar, 
which had its doors wide open. They could see movement coming from the back, but it wasn't getting closer. The group reached the front of the hangar building looking inside. It was empty, however they moved inside to do a check for smaller gas cans. As they went in, Garrett walked towards the back where the movement was coming from. There were a couple dozen zombies in the back office area, a small walled-off area with windows. He shook his head as he saw them all in fatigues, some ripped and bloodied, while others were intact but covered in the blood of others. Well, that's depressing as hell, Lyons murmured as he came up beside his companion. Garrett nodded sadly. Looks like they held the sick in here before taking off, he said. All it took was one reanimating for things to go south. Can't imagine being trapped in a room watching everybody get ripped apart, Lyons said, shaking his head. More concerning is the fact that they had them locked up in there, Garrett said, flicking his hand towards the room. How full were some of the other places? Lyons shuddered at the horrifying thought that there could be a zombie army somewhere on the base. All right, we're moving, Wrangle called. The privates gave one last look to the damned soldiers before running off to join the sergeant. They came out of the hangar and worked their way to the back, stopping at the side. Wrangle looked up the road at the buildings on either side of it. There were about twenty, thirty zombies within the next hundred yards, spread out pretty thin. There were, however, no signs of a fuel truck. What do you think, Sarge? Want to move over to the backs of those buildings? Garrett asked. Wrangle nodded. Might as well, he replied. Hopefully there's something hiding back there. The privates gave him a skeptical look, and he chuckled, shaking his head at the poor choice of words. Something like a fuel truck, he corrected. Not anything that's going to ruin our day. There you go, Lyons commended, and then the three soldiers darted across the road. They reached the backs of the other buildings, finding more zombies but something resembling vehicles at the far end, about half a mile away. Looks like we're in business, boys, Wrangle murmured, studying the zombies. There were thirty of them, packed relatively tight together, starting twenty yards up and going another thirty yards past that. There was plenty of room to their left, which was empty pavement stretching for a few hundred yards. In normal times, there would be an aircraft sitting there when not in use. But at this point, it was completely empty. What's the play, Sorge? Garrett asked. Wrangle pursed his lips. We can fight through them, but there's an easier way, he said thoughtfully. I need one of you to distract them, pull them away from the buildings, so we can get to those trucks. The privates looked at each other, and without saying a word, immediately launched into a game of rock-paper-scissors. Lyons threw paper and Garrett threw scissors, the former letting out a frustrated grunt at the outcome. Where do you want me to lead them to? Lyons asked dryly, as his opponent grinned. Wrangle looked around, glancing behind them and seeing an open field past the end of the runway. It stretched on for a few hundred yards before hitting some trees. There was a protective fence surrounding the base, but it was about thirty yards past the tree line. Pull them towards the trees and lose them in there, he instructed. Circle back to the plane after that. With any luck, we'll be loaded up and ready to roll. Lyons nodded and broke out from behind cover, not yelling out, but rather pulling out a machete and tapping it on the ground as he walked. He moved wide from the buildings, continuing to tap, letting the metallic sound echo and resonate in the air. One by one, the nearby ghouls noticed him and started moaning shambling in his direction. He shook his head as he walked, not exactly thrilled with being in that position. The zombies were far enough away from him that they didn't pose a threat, though. Wrangle and Garrett waited patiently for the zombies to get away from the buildings, waiting to make sure none of the others from the next row were joining them. Once the creatures were a good fifty yards from the buildings, they made their move. At first they walked at a brisk mall-walker pace, so as to not make any additional noise. But once they were a good fifty yards past the mob that Lyons was walking towards the woods, they picked up the pace. The duo reached the vehicles sitting behind an office building at the end of the line. They approached cautiously, keeping their wits about them so they wouldn't be surprised by anything jumping out. 
As they grew closer to the trucks, a few zombies made themselves visible at the side of the building. Wrangle motioned to Garrett to take them out. Garrett walked over with his knife in hand. The first ghoul didn't know what hit it, the knife sliding into the back of its head easily. As it collapsed to the ground, the second one turned just in time to see the blade ending its life. They stood there for a moment, making sure nothing else was around. Let's get the trucks, Wrangle suggested. The two soldiers walked over to the giant fuel trucks, inspecting the side panel where the nozzle was. Garrett let out a sigh as he saw the gauge on empty. I got nothing here, Sarge, he called, dejected. Wrangle inspected his with a sigh. Bone dry over here, too, he said. Guess they fueled up and headed out, Garrett said. Wrangle shook his head. I don't see it over here, he said, but hopefully Reed found the fuel depot. Even with every plane most likely sitting in the middle of Kansas right now, they wouldn't have used up the reserves. We can use the trucks and... Gunshots cracked in the distance, and both soldiers stiffened at the interruption. What the hell? The sergeant growled and smacked his communicator. Reed, why are you shooting? He demanded. There was no response, and the duo shared a worried glance. Reed! Wrangle barked into the communicator. The gunfire intensified, and they stood stock still, trying to assess the situation and listen carefully to the sounds. The sergeant honed in across the runway, in the direction of the plane. Let's move, Wrangle said, and then into his communicator. Lions, we got this. Focus on your zombies. Copy that, the private replied. Wrangle and Garrett ran as hard as they could back towards the plane, listening to the gunfire grow more and more frequent as they moved. When they reached the runway, dozens of zombies covered it, all shuffling in the direction of the noise. Let's get across and cut down, the sergeant cried. Garrett nodded, and they pumped their legs hard, making it to the other side of the runway. Sarge! Reed's voice came through the line. Sarge, you there? What the fuck is going on? Wrangle replied, relief flooding him at the alive voice of his corporal. We found the pumps, but there were raiders there, Reed explained. They shot at us on sight and pushed us back towards the plane. The sergeant growled and looked at the sky. Tell me you didn't lure them back to the plane, he asked with a wince. I'm not that stupid, Reed snapped. We're in the last building on that row, in the corner. We're pinned down. They're spread out across several buildings. Hang tight. We'll take care of it, Wrangle instructed. We're not going anywhere, Reed promised. The line went dead, and the two men rushed towards their comrades. As they went, more and more zombies converged on their position. We gotta get ahead of that mob, Wrangle huffed. Better pick it up then, Garrett said, and managed to speed up, even getting a few steps ahead of his sergeant. Wrangle couldn't help but grin at the determination, pride blooming in his chest. They made it to the far end of the buildings, turning towards the firefight, which was little more than the occasional pop-off at that point. They skidded to a stop outside the next-to-last building, leaning in to whisper to each other. Call it, Sarge, Garrett said. Wrangle peeked inside the window, expecting to see hardened warriors shooting at the corporal, but he spotted a couple of teenagers instead. His eyes widened and he stepped back, motioning for the private to look. Garrett leaned over and then shook his head vehemently, his brow furrowed. Teenagers? he breathed. Good, my eyesight isn't going. Wrangle muttered. Garrett clenched his jaw. You want to put them down? He asked slowly. The sergeant shook his head. Just follow my lead, he said. Garrett nodded, relief evident on his face, and Wrangle opened the window near the back of the building. The two men slipped inside undetected, and as soon as they hit the floor, the sergeant motioned for his companion to take the kid on the right as he took the one on the left. The teens were hyper-focused on the soldiers they were shooting at, completely unaware of the ones behind them. Wrangle and Garrett worked in tandem, stepping up and pressing guns against the backs of their heads at the same time. I suggest you drop that weapon now, son, Wrangle warned. Okay, okay, the kids squeaked, 
the gun clattering to the ground and his hands rising quickly into the air. The girl at the end of Garrett's gun did so as well, the two kids trembling. They didn't look like they were any older than fifteen or sixteen, and Wrangle motioned for them to stand together. The boy quickly embraced the girl, and she curled into his chest, staring fearfully at the soldiers still aiming at them, as Garrett kicked the guns away. Either of you the leader? Wrangle demanded. No, no, sir, the boy stammered, shaking his head. The sergeant nodded thoughtfully. Showing respect by saying, sir, I like it, he said. Who is the leader? My father Jacob, sir, the boy replied. You have a radio to call him with? Wrangle asked, cocking his head. No, sir, the boy said, shaking his head vehemently. We're not that sophisticated. The sergeant cocked a brow. Where is he? he asked. The boy shrugged slightly, eyes darting around everywhere. Probably in the building next to us, he said. How many of you are there? Wrangle asked. There were ten of us, the boy replied, his voice thickening. But I don't know if anybody got shot. Wrangle sighed. Okay, we'll figure that out, he said gently. But right now we need things to simmer down, because all this noise isn't good for any of us, you understand? Yes, sir, the boy replied, nodding like a bobblehead. Good, let's go meet Jacob, Wrangle said, waving them off and then glanced at Garrett. You stay in here, just in case shit goes south. The private nodded, taking up position by the window. Wrangle motioned for the young couple to go to the door, and they opened it slowly. He clicked his communicator. Read, stand down, we're coming out, the sergeant instructed. Copy, the corporal replied. The teens hesitated at the door, looking back at the sergeant. Don't worry, nobody is going to shoot you, Wrangle said, motioning them forward. Now get walking slowly. The kids nodded, walking with their hands held high. Wrangle stayed behind them, leading them right into the middle of what had been the shootout. Hold your fire! Hold your fire! Someone bellowed from the raider side. There were no more gunshots, silence falling over the space. I'm coming out! Somebody bellowed. Don't do anything to my boy and his girl! Wrangle nodded. They're safe as long as you behave, he called back. A man in his mid-forties, presumably Jacob, emerged, hands up in the air. Now, I want to stress this is just a big misunderstanding, he said immediately. Guessing that means you fired first, Wrangle asked, cocking a brow. I did, sir, the boy piped up, voice trembling. It was an accident. You accidentally shot at my men, the sergeant asked, skepticism clear in his tone. He's telling the truth, Jacob said loudly. This whole region has descended into chaos in recent weeks. We thought you were militants trying to ambush us and take what little fuel is left. Wrangle cocked a brow. But now that you know we're military, are we good? He asked. Yes, sir, Jacob insisted. I just want to take my people and go. All we ask is that you let us take the fuel we managed to pull out from the pumps. It's only about five gallons, but it'll keep us warm for a night or two. The sergeant nodded to the kids. Go be with your dad, he said. The teens ran over to Jacob, and he embraced them tightly. Thank you, he said, eyes wide with gratitude as Wrangle approached him, gun pointed at the ground. Don't thank me yet. We got a problem, the sergeant replied. As if on cue, a few gunshots went off in rapid succession at the building closest to the plane. Dozens of zombies came around the corner of the building, and the gunfire was coming from inside shooting out at the zombies, but in the direction of the plane. "'Watch your shots!' Wrangle bellowed. They stood there helplessly for a moment, watching, unsure of what to do next. "'How many people do you have in that building?' the sergeant asked. "'There's four, Jacob replied. Wrangle nodded. "'Okay,' he said, and then clicked on his communicator. "'Reed, I'm sending them to you. They're friendlies.' "'Got it,' the corporal replied. Go to the building back there, Wrangle instructed, pointing. Corporal Reed will get you situated. Is there anybody in the building you came from? Jacob shook his head. Just me, he replied. Good. Go, Wrangle said. Jacob nodded, 
herding the teens along with him. There was a loud crack as zombies began to break windows and more gunshots echoed, each one in the direction of the plane. He clicked his communicator again. Garrett, stay where you are, he instructed. Lions, get to the plane. Cohen, cover Charlie. A chorus of yes sir came over the communicator, and Wrangell drew his handgun, running up towards the mob. When he got close, he immediately started to unload on the ghouls at point-blank range. Like a carnival shooting gallery, he shut them down one by one, emptying an entire magazine into the backs of their heads, dropping them to the ground. As he reloaded, most of the still-standing zombies turned their attention towards him. Yeah, that's right, come my way, Wrangle challenged. A gun popped out of the broken window, and the sergeant barked, Stop shooting! I got this! The gun retreated into the building, and the mob came his way. There were easily about forty zombies still standing, and they shuffled towards him, arms outstretched. He clicked his communicator. When I give the signal, I want Garrett and Reed to fire off two shots each, he said. That should break them up enough that we can take them out. Both soldiers responded in the affirmative, and Wrangle reached down to his leg sheath and pulled out a machete. Now, he barked and four shots rang out from different directions in rapid succession, dropping a couple of zombies in the process. Several ghouls broke off in different directions, headed towards different areas of gunfire. Eight zombies were left, honed in on the sergeant. Gonna have to do, he muttered, and backpedaled a few more steps, giving time for the breakaway group to head to the buildings. He took a step forward and swung his blade hard, hitting a zombie right in the neck and decapitating it. The creature fell to the ground, sending a few more to the ground right behind it. Wrangle brought the machete down onto the top of another zombie's head, immediately letting it go and kicking it in the chest to send it into a couple of the others. The sergeant quickly drew his knife, stabbing quickly into another skull before dropping it and going to the one behind it to do the same. Wrangle moved like a whirlwind, slicing and dicing in a graceful dance of death. He dropped another one, picking up the machete and ripping it from the skull of a fallen corpse before swinging it into one of the zombies, trying to get up off of the ground. The last few remaining ghouls were struggling to regain their footing, making them easy prey for his blades. Within moments, the immediate threat to him was over, and he stood in the middle of a pile of rotted bodies. Wrangle looked back towards the building, seeing the men on Reed's side had taken out the ones there and were coming up from behind to the ones focused on Garrett. He slowly strolled back to the group, getting there as Reed and his team finished dispatching the zombies. As he approached, the people from the building nearest the plane came out to join them as well. Is everybody okay? Wrangle asked. Reed gave a lopsided grin. Yeah. Lucky these guys aren't great shots, he drawled. Lucky neither are you, Jacob quipped right back. Nobody got hit. The corporal crossed his arms. And why did you fire on us again? Reed asked. Jacob's son hung his head. I'm really sorry, sir, he said. I thought you were going to attack and I... He trailed off, voice choking, and Jacob patted him on the shoulder, his jaw set tight. His mother got shot a couple of days ago, he explained, and at the look of concern and sympathy on everyone's face, he held up a hand. Don't worry, she's gonna live. She's just salty about it. But my boy here saw it happen. Some of the gangs in the area have taken it upon themselves to claim this territory as their own. We've had some disagreements with them. The boy pressed his palms together, eyes wide and pleading. I'm so sorry, sir he said. I'm... It's all good, kid, Reed cut in, raising a hand. No harm, no foul. Jacob hooked a thumb in his belt as he held his son close. So what are you military boys doing out here? he asked. Just refueling, Wrangle replied. Got places to be and things to do. Jacob nodded. Best we can tell, there's plenty of fuel in the below ground tanks, but we have to manually pull it up, he said. Pretty sure one of those fuel trucks can get it done in a hurry, Garrett said, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. The older man's eyes lit up. You found a fuel truck? he asked. 
Garrett nodded. Other side of the base, he said. We just need a tank of gas, Wrangle replied. Let us fill up and you can have the rest. Jacob gaped at him, sputtering. Oh my God, thank you so much. Tears shone in the corners of his eyes. That would be just amazing. That fuel isn't much good for cars, but does wonders for heat. Sarge, you copy? Cohen's voice came over the line. Wrangle clicked his communicator on. Yeah, I'm here, he replied. We're all good over here. Wish I could say the same, Cohen replied. You'd better get over here. Wrangle shared a concerned look with the other soldiers that had heard the warning, and they all took off running. The civilians stayed hot on their heels, confused but understanding the urgency on the soldiers' faces. Wrangle's heart pounded. With Cohen's tone, he feared for Charlie's well-being, and if Charlie was hurt or worse, they were boned. When they reached the plane, relief flooded him at the sight of Charlie standing there, seemingly in good health. Cohen and Lyon stood next to him, deep scowls on their faces. Cohen, what's going on? Wrangle asked as they approached. Is Charlie okay? He eyed the doctor. I'm just fine, Sergeant, Charlie said. Wrangle shook his head with a shrug. Well, what is it then? He asked. Cohen grunted. Well, when our sharpshooters over there started unloading on the zombies, they missed, he snapped. He pointed to the engine on the right wing, which had a bullet hole in it. Fluid dripped out of it to the ground, and the sergeant winced. How bad is it? he asked, stomach sinking. Bad enough that we're not going to be able to take off, Cohen replied. Don't know what it hit, but it rendered it pretty much useless. Reed took a deep breath. How long will it take you to fix it? he asked. Assuming the parts I need are somewhere on the base, Cohen asked, shaking his head. About six to eight months, because that's about how long I figure it would take me to be semi-adequate in airplane engine repair. He shot the corporal a deadpan stare. Shit, Reed muttered. If you're worried about food and shelter, we have you covered, Jacob offered, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. We have plenty of room and food. Wrangle and Reed shared a look and a shrug. It's not like the mission is classified, Sarge, Reed said. And even if it was, who's going to know? Not like social media exists anymore. The sergeant sighed. It's not that simple, Jacob, he said slowly. We're on our way to the San Onofra nuclear plant. The older man furrowed his brow. That's a hundred and fifty miles from here, he said slowly. Why do you think we're flying? Reed asked, flicking a hand in the direction of the plane. Jacob nodded, pursing his lips, and then his son raised his hand gingerly. What's wrong with the plant? he asked. It's going to start melting down in the next... Wrangle said, checking his watch. Forty-six hours, and change. But, like Dad said, the boy stammered, shaking his head. We're a hundred and fifty miles away. We'll be okay, won't we? He turned to his father. Jacob rubbed his chin, his face somber as he seemed to realize how serious the situation was. No, son, I don't believe we will be, he said. So if we can't fly, how are we getting there? Wrangle asked, thinking out loud. Jacob, do you have any cars? The older man shook his head. Not any with fuel, he admitted. We have a couple of trucks, but they're on fumes, and we'll honestly be lucky to get us back to our camp. There are plenty of trucks in the neighborhood next to us, but again, no fuel. Cohen took a deep breath. And I'm guessing all you guys have found on base is fuel for the planes, he asked. The civilians all nodded. What about gas stations? Wrangle asked. Jacob shook his head. We're in a rural area, he replied slowly. Only place is a truck stop a couple of miles away, but... He trailed off, lowering his gaze to the ground. But what? the sergeant prompted. Jacob hesitated. It's where one of the gangs have set up their base, he said slowly. Wrangle glanced at his team, seeing looks of determination all around. Reed rested his rifle on his shoulder. Somehow, I think we'll be able to persuade them to share, he said. Wrangle looked at his watch again. Forty-six hours and thirteen minutes. He took a deep breath. 
Reed, take Garrett and Lyons, he said, formulating a plan on the fly. Find the main planning office on base. We need a road map of Southern California. On it, Reed said, heading off with the two privates. Jacob, where are your trucks? Wrangle asked. The older man pointed towards the pumps. About a quarter mile that way, he said. Wrangle nodded, motioning as he spoke. Preston, go with him and bring them here, he instructed. Everybody else, start unloading the plane. We're going to regroup at Jacob's place and figure out how to get this mission done. Move like you got purpose, because we're on the clock, and that plant is going to melt down whether we're there or not. He raised a fist in the air. Now move! There was a chorus in the affirmative. A few, yes sirs, even coming from the civilians as they spurred into action. Wrangle watched everybody work, glancing nervously down at his watch once again, as if he could will it to run backwards and give them more time. This difficult mission was quickly becoming an impossible one. The End